Hi everyone. Welcome to the virtual video course, Enter the Zohar. I'm Wellman, I'll be your professor for the duration. This is not your average course, and this is not your average book. If you're here because you feel, you think, you wish there was something more to life, you're in the right place. If you're starting to sense alienation between you and other people, between you and the environment, within your family, between you and what used to satisfy you, perfect. If you're scared that nobody has a clue about how to handle the floods, the hurricanes, the oil spills, the wars, and the hatred, and on and on and on, that's why we're here. There's a book. It's titled The Book of Radiance. That's in English. In Hebrew, it's called Sefer HaZohar. It's 2,000 years old, and get this. It was written specifically for this time, for the first generation that would one day wake up in a cold sweat and realize that the entire world is connected. We're one living, breathing whole. Pinch yourself. You're alive. You made it. You're a bona fide first generation member. You made it. It's time to open up this book and shine some of its radiance on the system that's connecting us and how it works. We're not going to need pencils or notebooks, just an open mind. And for those of you fortunate enough to have one, please open up your heart. What is the book of Zohar? Why is it important to us now? And how is it going to help us? Let's cut to the chase. Here's what we know. For centuries, the Zohar has been considered to be the most important, powerful book of Western mysticism, said to hold the secrets of the universe and all of the heavenly realms, mapping the worlds of angels, demons, and celestial beings it's filled with fantastical parables, odd references, and strange stories extracted from the Torah and the Bible, in which it comments, pointing to a hidden code, which if properly understood unlocks the secrets of life itself. Yes, a very mysterious work indeed, sure. Because it's mysterious, it's raised suspicions in some who are afraid its content and purpose are far more nefarious. It's the world's first occult conspiracy, a dark cabal. Hidden instructions on how to control the world, a source of power to the secret societies, the Masons, the Jews, the Vatican, who manipulate political, economic, and social structures, seducing the masses with childish biblical fantasies in order to enslave us so they can keep their royal lifestyles intact and prevent us from accessing the meaning and purpose of life. So, to some it's a sacred mystical force beyond understanding to be respected and revered, and to others it's a not so understood power to be used by some for their own deepest, darkest aims. They're both right. They both don't understand it, and that's how your brain sees it, because we don't understand anything about how nature works in people. We know a little bit about the laws of quantum physics, astrophysics, biology, geology, but as far as our place goes in the system, our desires, our emotions, our connections, how it works with that, I mean, look at your lives. Look at the world. I don't think so. But both are right to believe it contains something great about the purpose and meaning of our lives, and it's hidden from us. So let's just put all of our assumptions and fears on hold. Let's start from there. Okay, so why Bible stories? And why are those writings the most ingrained cultural influence of the last 3,500 years? The source of the major Western religions, you know each one thinks the other two have it wrong. Why are most of the world's laws and moral codes built around it? How come following them hasn't made a world that works? I mean, if it doesn't really make sense to us, and it doesn't line up with our modern science, and it isn't working the way it's supposed to, then why does it capture our imagination with such a deep hold on these feelings of right and reverence and mystery? Why do we think it's about the truth? Because it is, but we're not. It's meaning. Though it's precious and transcendent, it's hidden from us by the current state of our own nature, which, by the way, is also hidden from us. Look at it. Biblical influence is so interwoven into the fabric of our world, not depending on whether or not you believe it, not depending on whether or not you believe in God or you don't believe in God, but because its writings actually do clothe some general law of reality that interacts with our desires and our thoughts in some kind of special way. And this interplay has built and operated the human level of existence. Yeah, that's why we see it everywhere. It appears as though it's outside of us, but it's not. The Zohar is a true wonder, and perhaps the world's greatest work of, I mean, it has accurate data on physical cosmology and historical forecasts that predate events and discoveries by thousands of years, but its timeless genius is that it's a work not of art, not of science, but of purpose. And our inability to see it for what it is is because maybe, 
just maybe, our idea of what a book is just doesn't apply. Here. There is a great, and as far as we're concerned, totally imperceivable force that makes Kabbalistic books not books at all. They are, and the Zohar is, the actual structure of nature. It's a system of laws that flow down in a chain of cause and effect from a single, simple law in nature in order to direct this world. For the Kabbalists, the people of the book who wrote the Zohar and the Bible on which it comments, the term book, a book refers to the ability to access the mechanism and purpose of being, a method of transforming ourselves to make our nature come into balance with the underlying nature of existence, to penetrate that, to begin to engage in it as though we bend back the book's covers and turn the world inside out so that you and I and the cosmos and the force that connects it all are the words of the book with no covers and there's nothing outside of the story. Right now, whether we like it or not, we're being pushed by evolutionary forces to enter an interconnected, interdependent world. This is an entirely new level of existence where we have to reach a conscious connection to nature's underlying laws. The Zohar is the exact opposite of our dominant intention and why we want what we want. This is what the Kabbalists identify as corporality, our world, the desire to want for myself more much more than I want for anyone else. It's what we call egoism, but the why of the spiritual or holy books, the very thought they were constructed from is the inverse quality, the will to bestow unconditionally, without a shred of self-consideration, real loving, pure giving. We need that answer now, and it gives it to us from the point of view of what we're going to be, rather than from what we've been in a language that seems puzzling and ancient, but really it's the expression of a future that we can't perceive, because right now, for the time being, we're nothing like it. What it has to give us is meant for everyone, but you can't just jump in and read it. Its language doesn't come from the mind, and it's not made for the mind. It's made to be realized by a great desire and a passionate heart. It's like the heart of a child when he first discovers this world. He's soaking up everything. He's feeling opposite forces that compel him to grow. He feels hot, he feels cold, he feels light, he feels dark. Pleasure and pain, a relentless desire to try again. He plays and he mimics until he reaches that balance, not in his intellect. I mean, what mind does a baby use when he learns to walk? Considering that we're inwardly opposed to it, we don't know how it works or how to live it, we need a method of growing into this beautiful but seemingly impossible future of perfection. Zohar is putting us in touch with. Yeah. Zohar equals the complete, unified system of connections governed by a single, all-encompassing law, which is opposite to my nature. Equals nothing is excluded from the system or external to it. Equals the story is life with no end. Equals Demanding to be changed by the intention behind everything in the system equals a means of becoming inwardly identical to the single governing law of love equals the creation of a real world that works inside and out. Simple, right? But the spirit of high adventure anything is. It's going to take a bit of preparation, experiencing some new perceptions, unlearning some old ones, and seeing for yourself bit by bit what's what. And that will point you to the right attitude. And once you've got that, you can enter the Zohar. And that's precisely what this video series is gonna help you do. Don't worry, you're not gonna need to study, but you've gotta learn. Our next class will be Above Time and Space. We'll see you there when you have the desire. See you then. Oh, the left and right doors are locked. You'll have to take the middle. Good afternoon, everyone. Really happy to see you. If there's one thing I love, it's a packed lecture hall. So you all understand me, right? Speaking in English, everybody here speaks English. The Zohar is written in Aramaic. Aramaic was a language spoken in the Middle East about 2,000 years ago. 
If I talk to you in Aramaic or if I read the book in Aramaic, we're not going to understand. But English you're going to get, right? Right? Okay. I'm going to open this book. I'm going to translate something in English. Let's get inside. Further, he descended and struck the line. Initially, when this river rolled its waters down, Israel was in a state of perfection, for they offered up gifts and sacrifices to atone for their sins and to save their souls. Then the image of a line would descend from above, and they would see it on the altar as it trampled the bodies of the sacrifices, devouring them all, and all the dogs would fall to silence. Get it? Good. Language is a system of symbols that point to concepts, arranging them in patterns that communicate meaning. Great, but what's meaning? For us, sensation is meaning. At our core, sensation is the only thing we get or don't get about what we read. The words of every language on earth are about sensations that come from relating to objects. Even our words for emotions are only about things. If you're hungry, it's not just hungry. You're hungry for a salad. You're hungry for something. There's always a thing associated with that feeling. But what if you're expressing sensations that come from relating to forces that manage this world? Forces that aren't things, but influences you can't see, because by definition, an influence is above or beyond the things that it influences. And what if you're writing a book? Because what you want to do is make it possible for people in this world to enter those sensations to enter those forces that can't be described by thing words. The only way to cross that dimension is to use words that you can relate to. Use words from this world, but use them and work backwards up to the world of those influences. This is what the Kabbalists did when they wrote the Zohar. They created a cross-dimensional language called the language of branches. So the world we live in is the world of outcomes. Everything we see, everything that happens here, is the result of what already happened here. Down here is time, space, and our world. People, places, things, the objects and events of this world. It includes your feelings, it includes your thoughts. This is the outside of existence, the branch level of reality. These are the forces that manage the objects. This is the inside of existence, the causal, the root level of reality. There's nothing on the branch level that isn't the direct result of an upper force. It's said there's not a blade of grass that doesn't have an angel above it that strikes it and tells it to grow. These forces, they're expressions of a single giving field of intention that never changes. And this type of intention is the only thing that can create. The branch has no power in itself. It's all just raw material. It's like the wax after the imprint of a seal. The only thing it can be is what the seal imprinted into it. Boom. It's too late. It can't change anything. The raw material, it's the will to receive. It doesn't have its own existence. It only exists as a result of the upper force. So the only way to change anything is to rise to the root level. But until I start sensing the fixed upper intention, I can't escape this world. In the Zohar, names of people, David, Sarah, Pharaoh, places, the temple, a field, things, a sin, a chariot, a lion, an angel. They're all inner states of a person, advancing from the branch to the root level. I know, we get freaked out, we get confused by our religious conditioning. It's, it's hard not to respond this way, but you've got to unlearn that response. It's like, it's like a manual on quantum physics, but we're using emotional rather than technical language because that's how we're going to connect to the upper forces with sensation, with desire, not with the mind. Okay? He descended and struck the lion. The state of Bina, the force of giving, the upper creative. Initially, when this river rolled its waters down, reaction of the root level. Israel was in a state of perfection. Your desire to be connected to the upper force is able to make the connection. For they offered up gifts and sacrifices to atone for their sins and to save their souls. When you have a sincere need to rise above a part of your inner animal egoism, then the image of a lion would descend from above seat on the altar as it trampled the bodies of the sacrifices, devouring them all. Only because you want to draw closer to the upper force, to give to it rather than doing it for yourself. And all the dogs would fall to silence. And this happens despite the doubts your ego gives you. Learning this language is the same thing as rising to the upper world. By becoming inwardly like these sensations, 
makes us able to know what's going to happen tomorrow. Because tomorrow is what we intended. Okay, that's it for today. Remember, you don't have to study, but you do have to learn. When you read a really great book, you get pulled into the story. After a while, you don't even feel that it's a story that you're reading. It's, you're just living it. It's in your sensations. You become not just the hero, but all the characters and all the events. Your sensation enters and animates everything, and you live out the drama of all the connections and all the conflicts. The cover will tell us who wrote a book, but it never tells us who's reading the book, and why should it? And we never ask. But with the Zohar, it's totally different. You see, if you don't ask that question about who's reading, then you don't know what you're reading about. What is Wellman talking about? Come on, obviously it's me reading the book. Yeah, but what is that me? You're a body, and that private thing inside of it with its own feelings, its own ideas, its own desires. You're one of billions of me's, and you're all competing for survival and pleasure and love. You've got family, a couple friends, a bunch of acquaintances. That's pretty much all the connection you can take. As far as those other billions are concerned, they don't have anything to do with your, your me. As long as they don't threaten what you have, take what you need, well, it's a great, big, beautiful world. Live and let live. What's mine is mine. What's yours is yours. But you remember when we learned that the Zohar isn't a book, or it's not an object among other objects? Well, neither are you. And the Zohar isn't written for an individual reader, because there's no such thing. Underlying the countless people, objects, and phenomena we see in the world, there's only two things that exist. An unchanging creative law called Bore, creator, giving force, and two, a single creature the law built that contains the entire cosmos and everything in it, called Adam, the desire to receive, or the collective soul. They're not really two things, but they're two sides of the same force. Adam means resemblance, and depending on the quality of connection between the Creator and Adam, how different or alike they are, that's what projects everything we feel as either the physical things surrounding us or our private inner life. The creation didn't end with the appearance of the creature. It wasn't even the starting point. The creation that we see happened when, in order to give the creature independence, the giving force shattered the original desire to receive billions of desires, each with a dormant spark inside of it that's still connected to the others. There is only one creature, and it's built like a hologram, with each isolated lonely me part containing within it every other me plus the whole. No matter how it looks on the outside, humanity is one creature, and it's evolving as a whole. Your me isn't just you. It just thinks it is. You pick up and open the Zohar at the turning point of creation, and the one reading the book is the collective soul with amnesia. Okay, if that's so, then how come the more connected we get, the worse it seems to get? I mean, why has globalization turned into worldwide crisis and conflict? I'll tell you, we built a totally interdependent world and there's no place left to grow. There's nowhere left to run. We're being forced to turn around now and live in it. And it's the wrong kind of world for what we've become. We're connected on the outside and hating it on the inside. And we can't see a future because we can't imagine how we can live in an interdependent world if what we are is self-love. Because even if you tell me that I'm not gonna survive unless I actually care about the others, I'm still not able to do it. But now for the good news. Finally, we've actually revealed our true identity, who we really are. Okay, it's the negative side of it, but at least we can see it, and at least we can start working with it. And the extra layer of self-love, it's an illusion. We can connect above it if we really want to, but you can't change it on your own because you're not on your own anymore. Remember, you're actually that hologram 
So what everyone wants and values will influence you and everyone else. In fact, none of my feelings and thoughts and my needs, they don't even originate in me. That's who's reading the book. A piece of the hologram coming to terms with its identity. That's who needs the Zohar. That's who searched for this course. That's who opened the video. That's who clicked play. That's who you are. So be who you are. The only way to do it is to influence the hologram. You influence the hologram to influence you. That way the whole thing changes and the best part of it is you do it without focusing on your me. The key to doing that, it's called love your neighbor as yourself. Later. If you go down the hall to the uh, history or religious studies department, you'll see there's a dispute in academic circles about the origin of the Zohar. Now, there's a few theories, but the main one divides between some profs who say it was written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rashbi, 18 centuries ago in ancient Israel, and some who say it was written by Kabbalist Moshe de Leon, eight centuries ago in medieval Spain, telling people that he wrote it, he copied it from a long lost ancient manuscript by Bar Yochai. Basically, it comes down to a he said, she said, because uh, after de Leon's death, when a scholar from Israel came to see the original, Moses' wife told him that the manuscript that he said that he had copied it never existed. So 700 years later, the experts piled on. Now, modern scholars find that the Zohar is written in an artificial Aramaic with stray influences from medieval Hebrew, and that some plants and animals in the book aren't even native to Israel, but Spain. But something you've got to ask yourself, since it also mentions aspects of science and biology that we could have only recognized in the last decade or so, and by the same reasoning, how come they're not saying that it was written in the year 2000 by a scientist? That'd be crazy, right? They say what they say because they're not engaging the book on its terms. You can't judge this book by its cover or by its style or even the words it uses. You have to need what's in it. When you know the Zohar reflects the laws of nature from beginning to end, those quirks of time and fact, they're a wink and a nod to let us know that it's speaking to us now. It's meant for us now, and it always speaks in the present. Forget about that. The history of the Zohar is really a story about the ripening and eventual readiness of the human spirit to grow. There's a unique quality about the presence of Kabbalistic writings. They play this hide and seek with our ability to measure them from the outside. That's because Kabbalists make efforts to conceal them so they can be found by people with a true need to seek them out. Their authors know that the process of change demands two conditions, the right moment and maturity of the soul. In the second century, just after the destruction of the second temple, Shimon Bar Yochai was a principal student of the monumental Kabbalist Rabbi Akiva and among the leaders of the Bar Kokhba revolt against Roman rule. Tried in absentia, he was sentenced to death by the emperor, and for years they tried to capture him, but he seemed to have vanished. For 13 years he hid with his son in a cave in the Galilee, where they continued the study of the wisdom, and were granted the highest attainment of spiritual knowledge the Kabbalists from Abraham to Moses had acquired over the 3,000 years before his time, uncovering the entire system of nature. At the death of the emperor, Bar Yochai chose nine students and called them Idra Rabba, the Great Assembly. They were ten men whose inner qualities precisely matched the qualities of the natural system. In a cave on Mount Meron, he and his students created the Book of Zohar, telling them, I am arranging you as follows. I will speak. My son Eleazar will engage orally. Rabbi Abba will write. And the rest of the friends will converse in their hearts. He told them, that the Zohar could only be revealed at the end of the exile, and its appearance to the masses would signal the completion of a 6,000 year period given for the correction of humanity. As soon as the Zohar was completed, it was hidden.
because they knew at that time that the people of the world didn't need it and therefore would not understand what it said. Its pages were buried in a cave near the town of Sfat and stayed hidden for 900 years until they were discovered by a boy who sold them as wrapping paper to a fish merchant. A Kabbalist from the town saw and immediately bought up what remained of the pages, collecting them into a book which was secretly studied in small groups, making its way to Spain 200 years later. Still, its meanings remained closed until in 16th century Sfat, a young Kabbalist, Isaac Luria, the Ari, was able to grasp it at its deepest level. Using an arrangement of students similar to Rabbi Shimon's, he created works, the Tree of Life and the Gatehouse of Intentions, laying open the message and the method that had been locked in the book. From that point, anyone could study, provided they already possessed the correct intention and need. It's the nature of hidden things that they can only be discovered at a suitable moment when suitable souls are born into the world. It wasn't until the 20th century and history's fiercest explosion of human desire in the generation for which the Zohar was intended that a unique soul appeared, that of Rabbi Yehuda Oshlag, called Baal HaSulam, the master of the latter, the only Kabbalist in the 20th century to write commentaries on the Zohar and the works of the Ari. His work gave us the necessary final link connecting the lofty reach of the wisdom to our human experience. He is the only Kabbalist to ever offer a clear working method that can be used by anyone in the world. The question of why the Zohar was written is far more important than the question of who wrote it. The Zohar can't be understood and felt directly. It requires preparation and an accurate preconception of spirituality. Baal HaSulam's introductions to the book of Zohar, they guide a person's approach. They cultivate our inner properties so they can clearly see it and we can enter it. And just as Shimon Bar Yochai said 2,000 years ago, millions of people around the world are now finding the Zohar and through Baal HaSulam's works are able to open an entirely new level of existence. And now you are part of the story. By now, I'm sure you figured out that we're approaching the Zohar not from the outside, the way historians and religious studies prophesy it, but how the Zohar sees itself on its terms. Remember, everything evolves as a result of desire, and the only kind of desire that the physical universe, including us, is made of is the will to receive. But the Zohar tells us that the target, the fulfillment, the place that we need to evolve to is the opposite to that. The will to give, and that doesn't exist in us at all. What do you think? I know you don't believe it. From my little corner of the world, news starts pouring in about another disaster somewhere. I see the frightened faces of the people suffering, and I think, what if that was me or my kids? What a horrible thought. I didn't give last time something happened. I better do something this time. I don't have a lot of money right now, and who knows what'll happen tomorrow to me, so maybe I'll just keep it. You know, I'm so ashamed that I feel this way, so what the heck, I go ahead and I send some money anyway. There, see? I can give. I do feel a connection to others. Look, in this world, there are desires, and there's their physical manifestations, actions. But what if nature responds not to a person's actions, but only to his desires. You want to keep the money, but you don't actually let yourself. You send it. Yeah, but meanwhile, the desire to take is still there. And because of that, your outer giving, it's really inner taking. And deeper than that, no real help reaches the other person. The disasters keep on happening because only our inner desires change anything, and it's not changing. When you look at it that way, you can see just how opposite we are from what we need to be. Okay, so uh, what's the point then? The Zohar is asking me to do something impossible. Yes, if it depended just on me, I'd be separated forever from the desire to give. If it weren't for one thing, the law of equivalence of form. 
In the Zohar, the original intention, the blueprint behind creation, is to make a creature and bring it to complete fulfillment. The law of equivalence of form is the and bring it to part of the blueprint. Everything in existence is moved along by this law. On the inanimate level, it looks like the principle of entropy. From the moment after the Big Bang happened, exploding energy and spreading the universe out, entropy kicked in, slowing everything down until it will eventually reach a state of rest again. On the animate level, it looks like homeostasis. It's the pressure within living things to adapt to their surroundings. But even after things are guided into balance in the physical world, it's still just a balance. They still stay essentially what they were, and they're still separate things. It's not like that on the higher dimension of unity, where we experience the ultimate influence of this law. Equivalence of form is how we move in the causal forces. Where there's no time and space, something is separate from me only because my inner qualities differ from it. We enter spiritual place by attaining the same quality it has. If it wants something and I don't, we're worlds apart. If I want something and it does too, well now we're getting closer. If we desire the same thing, the same reason, we partake of a single intelligence. We're one and the same thing. But it can't just happen without my involvement because complete involvement is the goal. It's the ultimate fulfillment. The pure transforming potential in this law is always there. It's just waiting for my request. But not with words, not with actions, but with a need. This need acts like a beacon, a radio tuning device that's searching. It's trying to match the frequency of the waves that it wants to be able to play. Even just truly feeling that I would even begin to want this change in me, it already has a minimal similarity of form with where the law wants to take me. It's said that the secrets of the Zohar are hidden behind a thousand lock gates. But that's only so if you're going to view it from the outside. The Zohar addresses a single person, and everything is inside that person. Because of the law of equivalence of form, there are no locks, no gates, and ultimately, no secrets. So it's not the action that needs to change. It's the intention behind the action. The Zohar does give us a method of inverting our intention and working above the will to receive. It's called the work in three lines, but you're not ready to hear about that yet. Uh, what you do need to know right now is a little of what the spiritual is and how good it is. You're not alone in this. Equivalence of form is nature's guarantee that once you've got the right goal and you start lifting the veil on your intentions, on your real intentions, it will begin to carry you and perform all the changes that you truly desire to make. If you don't want that, you'll get more out of eating the Zohar than you will out of reading it. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, there's a little homework assignment. So for the next day, try to stop looking at what you're doing and see if you can catch who you're doing it for. Listen, when I started learning about the Zohar, sometimes I get really excited and really turned on about the amazing possibilities of the different kind of fulfillment, the different perceptions, the different worlds. I could almost taste it, or at least I really wanted to taste it. You know, it started to feel doable, tangible, you know? And then I got hit with all these doubts. I mean, I needed something practical. If what I have to reach for all this to happen is this unconditional desire to give, but my nature can only receive, and it will never let me do that. How am I ever gonna ever break down this wall between them? I was so disillusioned. It was like I'd lost the most valuable thing I ever had. I didn't go to class for weeks. And when I couldn't take it any longer, I cornered my teacher and I said, why did you open up all these feelings in me? I mean, if there's nothing you can tell me about what I could do with them, what's the purpose of all this? And he just smiled at me. And he said, congratulations, now I can tell you. I was planning on covering something else today, but I think you guys are ready for this. 
There's two practical keys, tools in the method described in the Zohar. And what you have to do to be able to work above your nature, to penetrate that iron wall that separates you from that higher level, that higher level of nature that we call spirituality, you've got to put one key inside the other one. Today we're going to talk about the first one. It's called the screen or the work in three lines. It's the way that higher nature is structured. So if you want to enter it, you have to work with what it is. Every other method from meditation to science, they're only aware of and they only work with one or two of these lines. But without the third line, it's impossible to break through that barrier. There's the giving force, the right line or plus, and the receiving force, the left line or minus. Even in an electrical circuit, you can't just connect them together or they short out and nothing happens. To get them to work, you need to put a resistor between them, but not a resistance to giving, a resistance to receiving. That's your action in the system, and the Zohar calls that effort the screen. The screen is the soul. This inner inversion, the building of an anti-egoistic intention, it's actually a sensor that allows us to feel what the Zohar calls the creator. It functions like a resistor barrier to the spiritual field so that we can feel it. You see, as long as we focus on the gift, we can never feel the giver, but we stay anchored in the physical world. We just unconsciously receive and the Creator remains concealed from us. We always think about fulfillment because that's what we're made for. The thought behind creation is an intention to make a creature and fill it with unlimited pleasure. We are the creature, the will to receive. It's what we're made of, it's not good, it's not bad, it can't change, and it doesn't prevent us from breaking through. We can't control the kind of desires we have, and we're not responsible for them. They come from the giving force, and so does the pleasure that fills them. The desires are not us. Only the reason we receive the pleasure is us. That's the only thing we need to work on, and it changes everything. If I intend to receive whatever it gives, not from me, but instead to realize the intention behind creation, if I feel the pleasure only to allow the Creator to fulfill His desire to give, then my receiving turns into giving, and I enter and I unify with the supreme intelligence behind nature. So receiving remains receiving, but above that, my intention and the intention of the giving force are one and the same thing, and we're both giving fulfillment to the other in the very same pleasure. The more strength I have to oppose taking pleasure only for myself, the greater the light that enters. In other words, the aim of my work is to have a constant aspiration for the giver, and this aspiration is also my fulfillment. So now, you're not controlled either by your will to receive, which is the left line, or the pleasure from the Creator, which is the right line. But you've become an independent desire to give, which is the birth of the soul. That's the first key. But to activate it, we need the second key, the second practical key. And we'll do that next time. A little exercise. This week when you visit your mom and she puts some of your favorite food on the table, see how much of it you can eat just so she gets pleasure from seeing you enjoy. Um, it's not spiritual, but it's gonna make things a lot clearer. How'd the exercise I gave you go? It's pretty interesting what happens when you invert the intention, right? It's a different world when you start to feel that pleasure outside of yourself. So listen, if you didn't do your homework, I'm just telling you, it's worth doing. Okay. Remember, there's two practical tools in the method described in the Zohar. The first is the screen. It's the work in three lines. It's also called the intention. But without that second tool, what you experience in that exercise, it's just a psychological thing. Now let's look at the second one. It's called love your friend as yourself. Here's what we know. Love your friend as yourself is the one idea that the human race has in common. I mean, every religion has some kind of version of it. 
It's this ethical arrangements of the world societies, they're all based on it. What's yours is yours, what's mine is mine, but I should treat people the way that I want to be treated. If I do good things for people, they'll do good things for me. So we do nice actions. You know, even if we don't really love the other person, we do these nice charitable acts. We can see how this works. I mean, throughout the ages, we've ended hunger, we've wiped out disease, we've put an end to armed conflicts. Everywhere, we brought about a brotherhood of man. And that's why we teach it to our children. We want them to get along, right? When they should feel good about themselves, they should be good people. And the track record of the human race clearly shows just what good people we are. Just what good people this sophisticated manipulation of others in order to get what I want produces. Love your friend as yourself. 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 It's the most counterintuitive, misunderstood string of words in the history of language. It's also the most important, but we don't realize it because we can't imagine that it actually means what it says. I mean, come on. Love your friend as yourself? The Zohar tells us it means to reach the sensation of the other as your actual identity your own self. You're gonna inwardly care for the need of the other to the same degree that you now obsess about your own, even more so, so that in your heart, what's theirs is theirs and what's yours is theirs. But don't worry, don't worry. Your me isn't you, it just thinks it is. In order to enter the Zohar, we have to take the first part of the method, the screen, and enter it into the second part, love of friends. Together, they form a lock and a key that open the door to higher perception. Love your friend as yourself. It's the general law of the universe, and it describes the ultimate condition of our being called the world of infinity, in which the inner existence of all people are united into one general system, completely interconnected and completely fulfilled by the giving force. All of the other laws of nature are just less complete stages of this connection. In the reading and the study of the Zohar, we work to simulate this configuration in the intention we bring to the others studying along with me. Now, even though the work with the screen is aimed at attaining the same inner state as the giving force, the love of God isn't the general law. Because with a hidden creator, it's easy to fool yourself. But whether or not you love your friend, the person studying with you who shares the same desire for change and the same desire to help you reach it, whether or not you love him with all your heart, soul, and strength, that's always right in front of you. There's something to measure. It constantly triggers the need to apply the screen and go above your reason that tells you to take the pleasure of spiritual advancement for yourself rather than working on the connection that makes it possible for your friends to reach it. It provides you with challenges and setbacks you need so that you can build this desire that you don't have yet, the desire to actually bestow. The work in transformation isn't about the individual and his screen reaching enlightenment, but about the connection between us that brings fulfillment to the whole. When this starts to happen, we're actually ascending. We're entering the upper system. In that state, there's no difference between loving the friend and loving the creator. In fact, it's the only way to reach what we call the love of God. That's the way we reconstruct the supreme law of nature in our heart and we begin to ascend to the upper worlds because a man's life is where his heart is. When you're doing that work with and for others, it doesn't matter what you do or don't understand when you read. Knowledge simply doesn't matter. It's because this inner effort you're making, it's lined up with the correct matching intention to the thought behind the text. And because of that, it's possible to draw direct lines between your inner state in that effort and what the book is saying. Then you can feel that tender, life-giving light of correction in the book. It's as though you're putting on 3D glasses and you can see this ordered dimension that used to be obscured by logic of a person's self-centered desire. This experience is no more bound by the covers of a book any more than your life is contained just within your body and your personal needs. That's where humanity's headed, one way or another, and you might as well know what's going on. That's almost everything you're gonna need to know. So if you wanna enter the Zohar, now you can, as long as you remember what you learned in this course.